Good morning. If you wanted to turn in your Bibles, we're going to Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. It reads, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ." We also, if you want to flip back to Romans 12, we have one more verse, Romans 12. In Romans 12, we are admonished, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly and never be wise in your own sight. This is the word of the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to continue in our study from the book of Philippians. You would think by the message I preached last Sunday, and then again the message that I'm preaching this morning, that man, uh, Vero Bible Fellowship must have a lot of problems with disunity, with, uh, you know, the church is fractured and it's in bad shape and all of that. No, it's not. Uh, Not that I'm aware of, at least. Um, what we have is we're a verse-by-verse teaching church. And so we're in Philippians, and the whole book is uh, about joy. Uh, We've titled the series out of Philippians, The Joy-Filled Life. But in chapter 2, Paul hits pretty heavy and hard the whole subject of unity in the church. And so that's why we're coming with this message, and that's where we are right now. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, As we open the scriptures today, we we ask that the Holy Spirit would speak through me, but Lord, would speak to everyone in the room. And you are a subjective God. Father, you, you, you care about people individually, not just about the corporate group, but Lord, individual. So therefore, in the teaching of your word, It's not just a corporate teaching, it's a very individual teaching. And and there's no way that I can do that. I have no clue all the various ways that people need to hear this message. So we're leaning heavily upon you to do your work, to make it applicable and personal for each person in the room. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we started chapter 2 of Philippians where Paul shifts in his letter to address his great concern for unity in the church. Now, why would he shift away from such a great focus on the mission of the church? And he talked about how we can have joy in the Lord even when we're being persecuted for sharing the gospel. And that really is the focus of the church. Is One of the great focuses is that we would be faithful to become salt and light in this world. And by being salt and light, you will take some hits. And so he had us going there that I can still have joy. Why? Because joy is not like happiness. Happiness is something that happens externally, outside of me. And I can sometimes be happy when right things line up, right? But I can't plan happiness unless it's my birthday. Um, Joy, on the other hand, is something that happens internally. And it has nothing to do with circumstances outside. It has to do with my understanding of God, my understanding of truth. And I'm finding my identity in Christ. I'm finding the promises of God that no matter what day I'm in, good or bad, these promises hold true. And so that's where Paul's been, and now all of a sudden he shifts over to this strong challenge or even rebuke uh, on on unity, church unity. And we're going to just stay with what Paul's doing, and I think it's necessary. I think it's a good message for us. He says in verse 1, so if there is any encouragement, that's Philippians 2 verse 1, if if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit— 
any affection and sympathy. And if you really want to break that down in the Greek, it's actually saying because there is encouragement in Christ, because of comfort of, of love, because of the participation in the Spirit, because of affection and sympathy. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I really cannot think of a more timely message for our church than this message on church unity. I think every church, even the churches that are getting along just great, I think periodically we need to come back and remind ourselves of the call of God to be unified. The culture in which we live in this world, it, it creates, it raises up selfish, independent, self-indulgent, even egotistical personalities and attitudes. People are given to more to material things than they are to people. And they don't trust anyone. Very few people that you, today that you trust in the world. And so it causes you to pull in. You're not reaching out, you're pulling in. And my great concern is that this flesh, these fleshly attitudes and behaviors they spill over into the church as we are inculcated by this world that we live in. And that will lead to Christians who are short-tempered, Christians who are far more critical towards one another, and Christians who are non-participatory. We don't get along with each other, therefore I'm not going to participate in anything. I just come, I sit, I receive, I don't trust, I don't want to get involved because I don't want to get hurt. And, and, and this is not the way God has designed his church. It allows for factions to develop where groups of people stand in opposition to others. You find the group that best represents your personal views, and then you join that particular group. And the outcome is a church that is doing battle against itself. It's just unhealthy. It's not biblical. Another threat to the church from the outside is bringing this, this self-governing attitude, which understand that in the world, in the governance at a state and national level, self-government is good. I, I think more Americans need to understand what self-government means. But as much as I believe in it, in this world, through governmental systems, it is not good in the church of Jesus Christ. The reason I say that is because there's no place for that in the kingdom of God. When it is introduced into the church, we care less and less for what it means to seek oneness. We care less and less to give ourselves away for one another. So the threat to the church from the world is very real, and it presents challenges, challenges to us. We can only pray that God's Spirit would bring us to see how in our own church these attitudes and behaviors can exist and that we would begin to corrupt the purity of God's name and his church. There's no excuse for any of us to conduct ourselves in this manner. The Word of God confronts us with our Christian responsibility and that responsibility is to live out the Christian life with our brothers and sisters, not against them and not apart from them. Jesus felt so strongly about this that he actually prayed to the Father before his crucifixion. And he said these words, he wanted us to be one as he and the Father are one. And even before that, he spoke to his disciples about the church that would be birthed on the day of Pentecost after he was gone. But he gave forewarning. He said, listen, upon this rock, I will build my church and my church will stand up against the gates of hell. Hell will not prevail over my church. But if a church is divided and in discord and factioned, then it's the opposite of the church that Jesus is building. 
So how do we maintain a spirit of unity among such a diverse people? Just going back to last week's message quickly, for those of you who are not here, uh, is it even possible for this diverse crowd of people to truly be in unity? Well, in verse 1, Paul gives us four reasons why the church should strive for unity. Number one, because there is encouragement in Christ, he said. Because of the work of Christ in our lives, past and present, because of all that Christ has done to encourage us. If, if, if he is encouraging me, he is also encouraging you. God doesn't love me more than he loves you. So whatever he's done in my life in the past, whatever he's doing in my life today, whatever his future is for me, he has the same for you. Number two, because there is comfort from love. Because Christ has lavished his love and tender mercy, his sympathy and his grace, his forgiveness and his care, he's lavished these things upon us. Can we not give to one another what Christ has so freely given to us? You see, others are just as dear to the heart of Christ as you are, as I am. I think sometimes we forget that, and we only focus on our needs, and we only see things from our view, and we don't take in, 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 we don't take in the idea that Jesus loves them as much as he loves me. I need to reach out. I need to extend because of the comfort of love that I've received. Thirdly, because there is participation in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. See, because of the work of the Spirit in my life, I have come into regeneration. I've been sanctified. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. He's a pledge from God to me that I will be with the Father in eternity. Hallelujah. And can you not do the same? Can't you see how God is enabling you? how he's interceding for you daily, how he's filling you up to the measure of the fullness of Christ, how he's making you fruitful, how he's strengthening you to resist temptation every day, how he's providing power for you to be a witness for Jesus Christ in this fallen world. He's doing all of this and more in you and through you because he is in you. You're participating with him when you obey the, when you obey the Spirit. And, and it's the Spirit's work in all of us. And if we're all obeying the Spirit, don't you think that's going to bring us closer together? Amen, it will. Lastly, because there is affection and sympathy. Not only has he granted you and I power, but he's granted us affection, love. He's granted us sympathy for one another. Jesus Christ has even prayed for that. I, I said to you, he prayed to the Father. In John 17, 11, let me give you the whole verse. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. The church is in the world. Not of the world, but in the world. Big difference, right? And he says, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may, they may be one as even you and I are. Are one. That's the prayer of Christ, that we would be unified. So the Holy Spirit is producing this unity in, his, in God's church, and it's you and I that he's working in. And then he goes to verse 2. That's just verse 1. In verse 2, he, Paul gives us the defining characteristics of unity. You'll find these characteristics in people that are unified, is what he's saying to us. So let me give them to you. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. What does that mean? That means think alike, being spiritually minded, knowing the mind of Christ, the mind of God, the mind of the Spirit, as revealed in his word. I'm not talking about you getting some picture or some word from God because everybody in the room would have a different word. I'm talking about what the word of God says about the mind of Christ, that I'm coming into understanding by the word of God how God thinks about this, the attitude that Jesus portrayed when he walked on this earth. That's what I'm having a sane mind with my brothers and sisters on. And then he says, having the same love. He's talking about how we conduct ourselves with one another here. In other words, equal sacrifice and equal service. 
that I don't look at you and size you up and determine whether I will serve you and help you with your need or not. It's not about your social status that determines whether you get my support. It's not about your, the color of your skin. It's not about your financial position with whether or not you get response. Listen to me. We are, to, we are all equal at the foot of the cross of Christ. We are all saved the same. And when it comes to our position in Christ, Paul makes it pretty clear. You are neither slave nor free. You are neither Jew nor Greek. You are neither male nor female. He's talking about your position in the presence of Jesus. Your, your identity is in Christ. And anyone who has that identity, you should be willing to support them and help them in their time of need. And then lastly, in verse 2, he says, being full, or not lastly, next, thirdly, being in full accord. And that's where we learned of the word one-souled. S-O-U-L-E-D, one soul. That means having one compelling drive, one compelling passion as a people. It's not everybody with their own drive, their own passion going their own way. That is not what it means to be a full accord. It means we're all at the same place at the same time with the same focus, the same passion. Listen, church, we are to live for the advancement of the kingdom of God in the church, and in the world. That ought to get an amen. Let me just say that again, because I think some of you were sleeping on me here. We should, be, we should be submitted to the work of the kingdom, both in the church and in the world. Every one of us. And then lastly, Paul says, and of one mind. And what he means by that is be intent on one purpose, the fulfillment of God's will so that he is glorified in all that we say and do. The goal of a Christian should be to bring glory to God, not glory to self, not glory to, any, to your ministry, not glory to your faction or your little group of people that see things the way you see them. As the church of Jesus Christ, we're unified, we're one soul. And our soul is totally in agreement to bring glory to the Father in heaven. So here Paul addresses us now. We, we move on now in Christian unity. We come to the third section of, of church unity, which is verses 3 through 5. And here Paul addresses how we are to come into Christian unity. How does unity come about in a practical sense? It's the how-to message how to be unified. In other words, how each individual in the room can unify with the group. So this message from this point on out, I want you to think subjectively. I want you to think about yourself. I want you to let the scripture become a litmus test for you. It'll tell you where you are in terms of being part of God's unified church that Jesus said hell cannot touch. Or whether you maybe have gotten sidetracked by flesh and have been part of things that are more fleshly than they are spiritual. So here Paul addresses how we are to come into Christian unity. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let me give you four points and then a thought at the close. Number one, Paul said, if you really want to be part of God's church, he gives a negative. Do not bring selfish ambition into the church. So number one, do nothing from selfish ambition. You see, as believers in Christ, we must remove selfishness. Selfishness, for some of you, let me make sure you understand, selfishness is not a spiritual gift. It's not even a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
It comes from your flesh. Galatians 5.19, listen, Paul said, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, and now listen to what he says. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, Clearly, these things are a work of the flesh, and Paul is warning the church in Galatia of such attitudes and behaviors. If it's beautifully in our fallen culture today to walk in those things, you can hardly turn on a television show or a movie and not, think, not find these fleshly desires at the forefront of the movie. This self-seeking pursuit, usually by unfair means, you go in, you'll go to any length to win with selfish ambition. In a nutshell, selfish ambition is driven by pride, by your ego. The pathway through selfish ambition is always destructive, not sometimes. It tears down, it doesn't build up. And as Christians, we are called by God to edify one another, not tear down one another. Paul says this in the beginning point to recover a spirit of unity. You have to slay the giant of self-ambition if you want to have the right characteristics to build unity in the church. Get rid of all that consuming pride that hangs out in the deep crevices of your flesh. Again, the issue of selfish ambition is the idea of focusing mostly on our agenda. That's what selfish ambition is really out for. I want people to see it my way. I've got my little group that sees it my way, and we're going to stand like stalwarts, and we're not going to let anybody change us, and we're going to try and let people know this is where it's really at, and what you're doing is less than what we're doing. God help us if we resort to such fleshly tactics. This is my cause. This is my faction. This is my group. This is my objective. There's none of that in the body of Jesus Christ as Jesus prayed to the Father. He didn't pray for that. Paul is warning the church of this evil. Why? Because as Christians, we should carry conviction and passion for the things of the Lord, not the things of self. The only problem is our pride begins to tell us that our ministry Our objective, our little group, is the most important thing happening in my church. We go around measuring which group, which ministry, which people are getting it and which ones aren't. And we end up putting people in different groups. Now we're categorizing the body of Christ. Periodically, somebody will come to me, Greg, how do you do it? Because you're preaching to people and half of them don't even get what you're saying. And you're preaching to them every week. you got to get just so sick and tired of the way some people are. No, I'm not. I'm thankful for all kinds of people that are here. Some of you say, well, I just wish everybody would just lift up holy hands before God without anger and wrath like me. I just wish everybody would lift their hands. Hey, not everybody's like you. you got a person who's during worship has got their hands folded, eyes closed. It looks like they're tuned out, and maybe they are, but they're here. It's an opportunity for God to reach them. God wants us to reach everybody that's here, regardless of what they look like, whether they measure up to my standard of righteousness or my standard of worship. And there's nothing wrong with raising hands, church, but there's nothing wrong with not raising hands. Paul is saying, let's not let these these things begin to separate us. Selfish ambition, it's such a deceptive evil that can infiltrate God's church. Paul saw this as a real problem in the early church. He wrote to several churches about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree 
and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You're not going to agree on all the doctrines together. There's a lot of secondary doctrines you don't need to, to agree on. You do need to agree on the primary doctrines of the faith. Amen? For it has been, it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, the church in Corinth. My brothers, come on. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? This is Paul really coming hard and heavy at the church in Corinth because they were at each other's throats about these things. Everybody representing their cause. The church in Corinth was in trouble. Some said, well, yeah, we're with Paul. No, we're with Peter. We're, we're with Apollos. Oh, we're the Christ group in the church. Enough already. The church cannot be divided into little factions and still exist. That's not the church that Christ is building, which will prevail against the gates of hell. It doesn't bring glory to the Father when we act like that. And so this leads Paul to double back and rebuke the church in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 1, he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Now listen, these are spiritual people. How do you know that? He called them brothers. They're in the body of Christ. They're Christians. But I can't address you as Christians because you're people of the flesh. Your cause might be a right cause, a good cause. There's nothing wrong with the cause. But you're wrong because you're quarreling with people who don't see it your way. He says, I have to address you as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, as I address you in this letter, you're not ready for it. For you are still of the flesh. He, now he calls it out. He says, I'm going to tell you what's going on in the church in Corinth. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? That's the way the world acts. And you've brought that nonsense into the church. Verse 4, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human, base in your thinking? Come on. He's saying you're fleshly. You're, you're a Christian that's working out through base things, things that the world does. There's no room for that in the church. Maybe it would do all of us well to stop watching so many television shows where base attitudes and base sins are so prevalent. The flesh can only produce fleshly self-ambition, where you become consumed with your own little ministry in God's church. It may even be a good ministry. There was certainly nothing wrong with Paul. There's nothing wrong with Apollos. There's nothing wrong with Peter. There's nothing wrong with Christ. Each one of those were good. They just weren't together. They had selected what they wanted to make the focus. And they were down on people. Look, you're, you're always down on whatever you're not up on. So if all you ever think about is one truth in the Scripture, there's a lot of other truth you're not thinking about. And you don't know as much about it. You're missing out. So Paul begins with this selfish ambition he prayed to the Father, make them one as you and I are one. Personal ambition, by the way, remember, it's more about a cause that you're part of. Your cause isn't all there is, church. Get rid of all that fleshly element. No place for it in the church of Jesus Christ. Number two, do nothing from conceit. I, I've separated those because they don't mean the same thing. He says, do nothing from conceit from selfish ambition or conceit. This sounds very similar to the first point, but it's not. It's different. The Greek word here for conceit is kinodoxia. It speaks of empty conceit. 
where the word selfish ambition is attacking a person to an enterprise, attaching them to an enterprise or a ministry uh, push, conceit is strictly focused on personal gain and glory. It's not you standing for a cause that you want everybody else to agree with and be part of. It's about you wanting attention for you. Now you're stealing glory from God. God doesn't go for that stuff in his church. He doesn't go for it anywhere. The, 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 the root of the word kinodoxia is kinos. What does it mean? An erroneous opinion. Listen to me. He's saying those of you who are seeking personal gain, you think that what you're standing for that brings attention to you, that makes you feel like you're right, you're actually wrong. You're not even right. You're in error with the word of God and don't even know it. He, he's speaking here of a person who's deluded in their mind. They, they're so given to personal gain, people seeing me as spiritual, see, people seeing me as somebody that they will turn to because I'm the man. Remember when Paul talked about the super apostles that were infiltrating the church and he was telling the people, he said, look, these guys are telling you these things like they've got all the inside connection. They've come up with new uh, revelation from God. They don't have new revelation from God. Well, the same is here. Whenever this attitude exists, unity is not possible, only discord. This is personal vanity at best. Thirdly, bring humility into God's church. Finally, he gets to a positive uh, principle. The first two principles are negative. Don't do these things. Now he says, this you want to do. Bring humility into God's church. He says, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. The third point is the prescription to get rid of the first two. <laughs> if you really want to move away from selfish ambition and conceit, you need to bring humility into your life. So this is very positive here. Instead of being personally ambitious and personally vain, maintain a humility of mind, a humility of spirit. This is the starting point for unity in the church. In, in other words, unity is born, listen, unity is born out of humility to the degree that that the church is walking in humility, they will be unified. I, I can't say that enough, and I hope you get that point. If you walk away, please get that. This, this church is hanging on humility for its effectiveness, for bringing glory to the Father, for prevailing against the gates of hell as we go out in the world and share the gospel, for keeping factions and divisions out of the church. Humility, that is the key. Nothing else. More significant has the idea of something or someone being superior. That's really what it means when he says counting others more significant than yourselves. See others as superior to you. Now, let's just think about that. That seems like an impossibility because nobody in this room is as important as me. And you feel the same way. Let me give you a test. When you sin, do you immediately confess that sin before God and, and just repent? Or do you make excuses for your sin? Or God forbid that someone would approach you in love and possibly suggest that you've gotten off track a little bit. And when they say that to you, you don't humble up, you bow up. And you call them out. You didn't receive at all what they said. You know why? Because you're not walking in humility. 
because you think you're more important or you're more significant than them. So let's practice an exercise right now in this room. When you sin, you, you downplay it. And you certainly don't want anybody else calling you out. But when others sin and you know about it and you see it or you hear about it, you, you can't forgive them for what they've done. It's amazing how we can see sin for what it is in others, but we can't see it for what it is in ourselves. That's a general rule for most Christians. No amens, huh? <laughs> Am I speaking the truth here today? I don't think I'm the only one in the room that sees that. I think we all know it exists. So how do I, if that's what I'm working with and that's what I'm up against that's hurting me from being part of a, a, a unified church and from walking in humility that I consider myself more superior, how do I then get to a place where I can see people more superior than me? Okay, simple exercise. When you see somebody who sins, do you know their heart? Do you know their heart? And how much of their heart do you think you know? You only saw that one sin. Or maybe you've seen three or four sins in them in the last month. Okay, so you know about three or four sins in them the last month. Now, what about you? When you sin, and by the way, you do know your heart. You don't know other people's heart. You only know what you see, and that's a very small little fraction of what, who they are in their heart. But you do know all of your heart. And every day that you live, you sin. Wrong attitude, wrong thoughts, wrong words, wrong reaction, wrong criticism, wrong judgments against people. That's all your stuff. And you're seeing it in you all the time. You see a little fraction in somebody else, but you see all this stuff in you. Does that not give you the understanding you need to recognize that I don't need to be looking at my brother or sister and their sin I got a whole lot of sin to worry about myself. Now look, you're under the blood. The work of Christ has forgiven you of your sins. But God still wants us to repent and confess our sin when we commit it. You got your hands full, folks. You don't have time to see everything in somebody else because you can't. So now think about it. Who's superior if you just look at the first-hand experiences that you've had with yourself and the first-hand experiences that you've had with people who sin. Who's superior? It has to be them. Why? Because you can't see all of their sin. You only see all of yours. You're focused on your mess. You should be. Can I give you a couple biblical examples to back up? Because some of you are going, we don't care to hear your opinion on it. You're just giving us your opinion. No, I'm really not. I'm hiding behind the Word of God. Let me take you to one passage. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And let's go ahead and let me just tell you what it says to set it up, and then let's look together at this passage. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So they think they're better than others. That's what we're talking about. That fits. Listen, he says in verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners and unjust adulterers or even like this tax collector over here. Why is he even here at the temple? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. He's not at all concerned about his own sins, is he? 
He's only, he's only justifying his self-righteousness. He says then, but the tax collector standing far off, Jesus is speaking, the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. He was not at all looking at this Pharisee who was acting so righteous, but who was a hypocrite. He's not looking at that. But he beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Wow. He couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. He was so weighted down with his own sinfulness. He couldn't even look over. He couldn't look up and he couldn't look over at others to see their sins. He could only see his own sin for what it was in the eyes of God. And it broke his heart and he repented of his sin. And Jesus finishes the parable saying, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself, you don't want the Lord to humble you. Humble yourself. Start seeing others as superior to you. See your sin for what it's doing in you. That man will be exalted. And if that's not enough, how about Paul himself? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he said this, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Wait a minute. You're the Apostle Paul. You're one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. You're the greatest missionary that's ever walked the earth other than Jesus. And you're saying that of all the sinners, you're the foremost sinner? That was how he saw himself. He didn't have time to measure and size people up at the church service. He just knew his own heart, and that's what gave him the humility to speak and the right to speak to us and to the church at Philippi, calling us to consider others more important than us. Number four, don't only look out for your own personal interests. Don't only look out for your own personal interests. This is, a, this is a tough one because we live in a society where fewer and fewer can be trusted. So it forces us to look out for ourselves. But in the church, we cannot conduct our, ourselves this way. Because if you do, you'll never walk in unity. The idea here is of the verb look out for, which means to regard as your aim or your goal. What's the aim? What's the goal? What did Paul say? He's saying, look out for other people's interests. Don't just look out for your own. Look out for others. The reason we have conflict and disunity in the church is because we only focus on our needs. We stop looking at the big picture. We don't care about someone else's enterprise. It's called a silo mentality. A silo mentality. Those of you who farm or who are around farms in a rural part of our of our region or those of you who grew up on a farm somewhere else and now here you are uh, you're very familiar with the with the idea of a silo it's where you would store your grain but the thing is you would bring in different kinds of grain and so you'd have to have more than one silo back in the day so you might see two or three silos at one farm and in the church, the idea, the taking and borrowing, borrowing from that analogy, is that I only see what's in me. I'm only concerned with the enterprise in the church that I'm part of. And if that's you, you have a single silo mentality. You have no interest in the other silos that are at the church. And God's saying, no, wait. I, I, I need all the people engaged and involved in all the ministries. Everybody can't be part of your ministry. 
everybody's not supposed to look like your ministry. God has put some people in this church to be part of a different silo, but that silo, every silo should see the importance of connecting with the others. We are all here together for the right cause. That is to lift up the name of Jesus. That's to bring glory to the Father. That's to expand the kingdom of God on this earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus prayed. We are to carry that out, church. And here's what I love in verse 5. Christ is our model for unity. He said, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Which he's saying, everything I just spoke about, that's what the mind of Christ is all about. So you can have this. By the Holy Spirit, he will bring to, to, to remembrance these things that you are to walk in so that you are part of a unified church. But, but he's not just talking about that. He goes on to verse 6 and on down where he talks about the model of Jesus, how he lived out humility, how God used him to fulfill God the Father's plan on the earth. Jesus didn't come to the earth to fulfill his own plan. Jesus didn't have a plan. He submitted to the plan of the Father. He obeyed the Father like we are to obey the Son. And we are fulfilling the will of the Father as well. If we walk in obedience and if we're submissive to carry out the church as he's called us to be unified. So next week we're going to cover Christ as our example. And Pastor Brenton is going to bring that message. How exciting it's going to be to take a close look at Jesus, the greatest mentor, the greatest model that we can have to flesh out these things we're talking about. Uh, flesh out. No, that's a bad term. Okay. <laughs> to to spirit, spirit out these To walk by the Spirit as we ought to. Amen? Today, let me just say this in closing. How important it is that we are saved. That's the ground rule. You can't even begin to try and, and bring unity to the church unless you're saved. Do you know why? Because the church isn't people who show up on a Sunday morning. The church is people who have been called out of darkness by God and have come into the marvelous light of Christ. You've got to be saved to be part of the church. So if you've listened to this message and you've taken copious notes, I don't know that anybody has, but if you have, but you're not saved, you'll never be able to contribute to the unity that we're after. You have to be filled with the Spirit of God after he calls you and saves you. Amen? Amen? So what is salvation? Very simply, it's coming to terms with the truth in the Bible that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden after God made them beautiful and perfect. They chose to sin. And that immediately caused God to remove them from the garden. Because now they're in an unregenerate state. Their spirit that God gave them is now dead. They cannot fellowship with God in that state. God is holy and perfect, and now because of sin, they are tarnished and they are corrupted. They've sinned. That's the bad news. And every single human being, every family member, every employee or employer that is apart from the work of Christ on the cross for their sins is destined for eternal torment in hell because God is storing up wrath and anger and judgment against sin and sinners. That's reality. He started out where if Adam and Eve... Adam and Eve had not sinned, everybody born of them would have had the same spirit that they had. But that's not what happened. So now, what are you going to do with that? 
You're in a sin condition. You're, you're lost for all eternity. Well, God the Father is the only one who could do something about that. You can't do anything about it. Why? Because you're unregenerate. You're not going to be good enough to measure up to a perfect God. You're imperfect. So Jesus was sent by the Father, the incarnation. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, who is fully God, who was with God in the beginning of Genesis and with God before the beginning, now comes incarnate as a man, born of the flesh, and yet he still is God fully. But now he is also fully man. And he lives a perfect life and never sins, even though he was tempted in every way that every human being is tempted. And that made him the only candidate who could go and suffer the full wrath and anger and punishment of God against sin and the sinner. He became the substitute for us. When John the Baptist, the final prophet, cried out seeing Jesus, he said, look, behold, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus went to the cross as God the Father ordered him. That's what the Father wanted of him. He submitted to the Father. He went to the cross, and God on that cross poured out all of his anger, wrath, and judgment upon Jesus. The sky grew dark. Jesus even cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me from before the beginning? I was with you. I am God. But see, he came to suffer and die as a man. And God put on God the fullness of his measure of anger and wrath and judgment. And Jesus died. The really good news is that three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead with a regenerate spirit because he's God, right? Immediately. And he was, while he was gone, he was still around. He was still in fellowship with God. But he was raised as proof that his death on the cross satisfied everything God wanted to pour out on sin and sinners. He poured out on Jesus, and it paid the price that no man could pay for his own sins. That ought to be good news for you. You ought to think about resurrection all the time, not just on Easter. And because of that work of Christ on the cross, if you believe in him, you confess that you're a sinner. You recognize, like that poor tax collector who could not lift his eyes to heaven, he was so weighted by his sinfulness. He saw his sin the way God sees sin. He didn't have time to look at other people or blame this or blame that condition or that consequence of life. He could only see his sin and he repented, which is two things. First, it's, it's a knowledge. I've come into the understanding of who I really am in my sin state. I no longer think I'm a good guy. I no longer see myself as being good enough for God just based on my reputation, based on my good works, based on my ability to give to so many foundations. All you can see is what God sees. That's the first step to repentance. The second step is you have this, and that leads to a godly sorrow, right? You're sorrowful over your sins. And then that leads to the second thing. You turn and go a completely different direction. I used to go this way because I thought, but I've come to understand who God is and who I really am apart from him. And now, I'm going God's way. It doesn't start with a change of direction. You can try that for a few days, but you'll screw it up. Your flesh can't live it out. 
You've got to understand the sin condition. You've got to repent of sin. You've got to confess it before God. And then, with a clean heart, as God has saved you, now you turn and you follow God. Now the Spirit of God lives in you. Now that dead spirit, because of sin, has been regenerated. If he could raise Jesus, he can regenerate you. And he gives you a new life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You're going a new way. I just shared with you the gospel. That's not even the whole gospel. The next thing is the sanctification process. Now that you're saved, the Holy Spirit every day is going to work to conform you to the image of Jesus. And he is a hound dog. He will not let up. He wants you to look more and more like Jesus. Why? Because you're called to be salt and light. And the only salt and light the world needs is Christ. Christ in you. And then one day you're going to die physically. But your spirit will never lose consciousness. You'll take your last breath in this earthly tent and you will enter into an eternal bliss with the Father. You will be saved. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not another time, today. Oh, what a, what a wonderful plan God had for us. Amen? Amen? He's such a good God. My prayer is that you would receive him today. If he's calling you, his desire is to regenerate you, and he can do it, and he will do it. You just need to surrender and see your sin for what it is and then believe upon the one who became the sacrificial lamb in your place. You should have hung on the cross, but God put himself on the cross so that by faith you are saved, by grace through faith you are saved. Amen? Amen. That doesn't happen with you standing up and walking forward. It doesn't happen because you raise a hand. It doesn't happen because you pray a prayer that I, you repeat after me. It happens the second that you see your sinfulness and you cry out to God with your confession. If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse of all unrighteousness. Receive that today. Father, we do give you thanks for your great work. Not a single person in this room deserves it. And what qualifies for it is recognition that we are undeserving. Like that, like that man, that tax collector, he knew he didn't deserve anything. He was so weighted down by his sin, fully aware of his sinful condition. We cannot come to you and be saved with any less response. It requires repentance. So, Father, I pray that you would grant that today. Grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached that great sermon, and he literally called out sin, he preached the gospel, but the gospel was offensive, and it should be offensive today. When you share the gospel, what I said about every person being in, lost in sin, that's offensive to some people today. That's okay. Let them be offended. You're sharing it because you love them. And you never know, one day they might return and receive it, right? But that day, he called out the Jews. And what did they say as God began to burden their heart with their sinful condition? They said, what must we do to be saved? They asked specifically. What did he say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord. Repentance is critical. Amen. Repent. And by the way, we are still rescheduling our bap baptism service. We didn't have enough people. I want it to be three or four, five, seven, ten people that are baptized. So, so as the Lord saves, we will baptize. You can be part of that. I'm going to give a teaching. I'm not going to do it today, but I am going to give a teaching on baptism for you to understand what it means to be baptized. And then you have that opportunity.
thank you for being here today. Thank you for being part of God's church. And let's strive towards unity. How? Practice humility. We've learned how to do it today. Let's do it. Amen? God bless you. God bless you. Go to the back table if today you've given your heart to Jesus, you've surrendered. Go ahead and go to the back table and let them know that so we can, we can get in touch. I'd like to speak to you about it. God bless.